The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is one of my absolute favorites in the <laughs> macro space, in the investing space, in the freedom space as well, which is so important in today's day and age. His name is Mark Faber. Mark, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Well, thank you very much for having me on your show. So there's so much to talk about. Uh, let me just go and start by getting kind of your what you're thinking about right now uh, as far as macro, maybe pertaining to the United States and inflation, interest rates, yield curve control, and then we'll kind of expand on that. Well, uh, as you know, we have uh, artificial stimulus in the form of expansionary monetary policies where the federal reserves balance sheet has expanded by close to four trillion dollars over the last 12 months right. and other central banks are also printing money and expanding the balance sheets and at the same time we have now fiscal expansion in other words biden's stimulus packages where the money is being handed out or under the pretext of infrastructure expenditures, money is being stolen by politicians for their own agenda. So basically, we have an artificial economy. It's not the normal economy that moves on its own, but it requires this artificial stimulus. And what it, this artificial stimulus has done, admittedly, it's propelled the S&P and other indices uh, to the highest level ever in the United States. And even recently emerging markets have performed very well. And European markets have also begun to, be, to perform well. So stocks are okay. Uh, property prices have gone up again and uh, in some areas substantially. In the main cities, not, and not for commercial properties that are maybe a third empty. And uh, for housing in the center of cities, that hasn't done well. But in the countryside, it's done very well, as I expected. And we have, of course, these artificially low interest rates where bonds are very expensive. In Europe, you still have close to a third of the government bonds having a negative yield. In the US, we had a rout in the government bond market uh, for the last, say, three, four months, where the yield on the 10 years treasury has more than trebled from the lows in August 2020. So now the question comes up, uh, what happens if this artificial stimulus stops? Or will this artificial stimulus continue? And as in economics, as is the case in economics, in order to keep its momentum, will it, ha will it have to be increased over time? Absolutely. So this yes. is a very, uh, you know, is more a political question. And uh, I'm afraid to say that this artificial stimulus has actually worsened conditions for many people. It's improved the conditions of the 0.01% of the population that are big shareholders, big property owners, and so forth. But the normal guy on the street, what I would call the average person, the typical person, worldwide is still suffering very badly from the crisis that was induced by governments. It wouldn't have had to be this bad, but governments with their continuous intervention and they know it, their know-it-better attitude and their arrogance and viciousness, they have destroyed the lives of millions of people that have lost their businesses, with, which they had built up with accumulated savings, these businesses will not come back. Yeah, that's right. And let's go back to the 
kind of the plight of the average Joe and Jane. I read a study that incomes in the United States, and this was a study done by the government, the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, I believe, from Q1 to Q2 in 2020, average incomes in the United States actually went up by 30 percent because uh, just from Q1 to Q2 because of the additional stimulus and unemployment benefits. But to your earlier point, are, are we building the entire economy around stimulus checks? So the entire demand side of the equation is government spending. And uh, what, what comes to mind there is Venezuela because you've got an economy that's completely built around one thing. And when Venezuela, it was oil. So when the price of oil goes down, so does the whole economy. They've got to print to get their way out. You get hyperinflation. But is the United States doing the same thing in the sense that they're building their entire economy around one thing, and that's stimulus? Therefore, it becomes a political question that, that the economist and, and the investor has to ask themselves, do we get more stimulus, less stimulus, no stimulus? And that answers all the questions that you need uh, or, you know, to figure out what to do with your portfolio. <laughs> well, I think we'll get more stimulus because once you went down the path of money printing, the Fed has been expanding its balance sheet uh, for the last 30, 40 years, but right. at an accelerating rate since the great financial crisis in 2008. But that has to continue, otherwise the system collapses. They tried to normalize it between 2019 and August 2020. But, uh, sorry, uh, and uh, August, uh, between 2018, I apologize, between right. 2018 and August 2019, they tried to reduce the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. But then in 2019, in August, there were some problems in the repo market, as you remember. Right. And then immediately the Fed decided to flood the system again with liquidity. That was long before COVID-19 became an issue. So we can see it's once you embark on money printing, it's very difficult and only possible under great pain to do it. And the U.S. with its Vogue society, where even large corporations are now becoming Vogue, right. uh, well, yeah. will not do that. Yeah. So we, we, the, the answer is yes. We're, we're, we're continually, we built an economy now around government spending and stimulus, but it, we're, 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 I always look at it as a heroin addict in the sense that the heroin addict starts to take the drug and they get more and more addicted. <laughs> You're talking feel... about Hunter Biden or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking about the U.S. economy. And the, the he economy... is a typical representative of the U.S. economy with a dad who runs the country. Right. That's yeah. America nowadays. Yeah. Well, when's the last time you were in the States? <laughs> Two years ago. <laughs> Two, well, I, I don't spend much time in the States, but I've been here over the last six months. And I can almost assure you that if you came back today, you wouldn't recognize it. You, you, you well, would I not would recognize it. Already two years ago, I was treated like a criminal if I had a cigarette somewhere. Oh, you, you, you can't even imagine what it's like yeah. now. But now you, you've got 10 times more <laughs> homeless people. I mean, I'm in Tucson right now. It, it's it's everywhere you go, especially downtown. It's homeless people. It's people addicted to drugs. And you've got that. And then you go to downtown Scottsdale and every single person is driving a Ferrari. Those, those are the two. <laughs> oh, seriously, those are the two groups of, of yeah. individuals that you have. And yeah. that's what this has done. That's what this one trick pony economy has produced that is dependent on uh, government stimulus. But to your point, it's like the heroin addict. They need more and more and more of the drug to get the same effect. So assuming that that's what the American economy's future looks like, how does that play out with interest rates, with stocks, with and then with the dollar, of course? Yes. I mean, stocks can go up a lot more if you keep on printing money. 
uh, the escape valve is then uh, a dollar that weakens. But you understand, if the other central banks do the same, namely print money, or even more so like the Turks did or the Brazilian did, then the dollar could be strong against some currencies, but it will go down against precious metals and cryptocurrencies. Right, or goods and services, yeah. That's so what will happen. The bond market will, of course, weaken at some point. It's actually interesting. The dollar has been strong, but not that strong considering that I can buy now a U.S. Treasury for 10 years at the yield of 1.7%. And in Europe, in Germany, I get a negative yield or in Switzerland. You understand? The yield differential has uh, grown dramatically and it hasn't made the dollar much stronger. So if we think this through, through then if the interest rates in the US came down again, and I happen to think that the economy is not as strong as the market is perceiving it to be, mm then I think the 10 years, if they go down to, say, 1.4%, 1 1.3% yeah. from the 1.7%, I think the dollar will weaken again. So you see the long end of the yield curve actually coming back down more. Uh, you think yes, I think so. Pressure will take hold but, again. Yes, I, I think as a contrarian trade, I think the 10 years looks quite attractive mm. to buy. But not for the long term, you understand? It would yeah. have been uh, for a trade, for a trade, where say you buy there's an ETF, the TLT. If you buy the TLT today, I think it could rally ten percent. So assuming that that happens and we get some more deflationary pressures because we get gridlock in Washington and they just can't get out this next stimulus package to <laughs> give the heroin addict what it needs, what well, what would be the catalyst, Mark, for uh, we, for the transition from those deflationary pressures back to inflation or potentially stagflation like we saw in the 1970s? Well, I, I mean, I think they will get the package through because, as you know, every congress, congressman can be bought. The question is how much you pay him. So they'll buy the Republican congressman and they'll agree and even, on some kind of a package the question is, you know, the package is this big. How much goes to the Democrats and how much to the Republicans? But eventually they'll all agree, as long as money flows through the pockets of politicians. So I think that will happen. But as you know, in the world, everywhere where the government became a larger part of the economy, right and the private sector contracted relative to the overall size. In other words, the government takes a larger and larger share of the pie in every instance, without exception, the growth rate of the economy slowed down. Mm. And in the, perfect in the perfect instance of the government taking the whole economy, like in the Soviet Union, or Russia, or communist uh, Vietnam before, and uh, China anyway, the whole economy, when it's owned by the government, collapses, period. Right. right. Yeah, and I, on that note, I'd like to remind everyone that I, I've done a couple videos on this, and going back prior to the Federal Reserve, the, the, the government accounted for about 3% of GDP, government spending. Now, prior to COVID, uh, it was around 45% when you include the local governments. And, and now it's, uh, it's close to 60% uh, of, of GDP is government spending. So, you know, to your point, if this continues, uh, you know, where's the level where um, 
the, the private sector just continues to shrink and shrink and shrink uh, as far as economic output. And, you know, that leads me to kind of thinking through inflation because it's not just the demand side of the equation, it's also the supply side. And if the private sector is producing less, then that would lead me to believe that there's fewer goods and services for people to buy, therefore prices going up, assuming that they're continuing with the stimulus or, or universal basic income. That is uh, correct. Uh, whether prices will go up uh, depends on a number of factors. But I think uh, in, in general, I want to give you an example. I know a young man and he's uh, not the most intelligent person I know. <laughs> he's, uh, he, he's failed. <laughs> he's failed his school exams, so he started apprenticeship. But he also failed at the apprenticeship, which is quite an achievement in mm -hmm. Europe, because in Europe, usually everybody goes on, you know, the apprentice, some are a bit better and some worse, but to fail is very unusual. In countries that are, that have a socialist mentality, but anyway, he failed, and he wrote me, well, I invested in uh, December in Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. He couldn't open an account because he was too young, but at the, po at the railway stations, apparently in Switzerland, you can buy fractional Bitcoins. Instead of buying a ticket, you can buy Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. And so he bought, and it's gone up three times. And then he, he said he also wanted to buy GameStop. At the time, it was $20. Uh, and he couldn't because he was too young and his mother didn't want to overwork out for him. So, but basically, uh, he did uh, well with his account, you understand? So the guy, he thinks, why should I work? I can make money in stocks. So a whole generation of young people is coming up who are day traders. They don't work anything. They they rather stay at home. They go out to the pub or anywhere and they meet the guy. He earns $3,000 a month and they can earn 3000 day trading a day. They think the guy who works in a job is an idiot. It create. I tell you, you want to destroy a society, print money. This is the worst that can happen, the very worst. And you will see in America, capital spending will be poor because the regulatory environment is so bad against the small businessman. They don't want him. They hate him. The small businessman who is a Korean and Asian, they also hate him. Because he's an Asian. The Americans, for some reason, they have to link everything. Oh, it's because of Russia. Oh, it's because of China. You're right. It's never the politicians that fail. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a fantastic point. On another anecdotal story that I'll let you know, uh, I've, I've been in the U.S. And, and now, here in Tucson at least, it is almost impossible to get an Uber driver. Almost impossible, Mark. And I don't know if you used Uber when you were here in the United States in two years ago, but it was maybe five minutes, almost anywhere you were in the United States, yes. five minutes and you'd have an Uber driver. Now, every single time I try to get Uber, it just says no cars available, no cars available, no cars available. You're lucky if you can get one within 45 minutes and it goes right Why back. Why is that a shortage of drivers? Yeah, there's just no drivers. No one's willing to work. <laughs> So, so in, in, it, yes, this is the incentive. Many people get more money from the government than if they would work. Then yeah. they have a disincentive to work. Yeah, and then to your point, with whether it's Bitcoin or stocks or whatever, we've we've turned everyone into day traders. I remember I was out at, at a golf course the other day on a driving range, and it was right <laughs> next to the local university, University of Arizona. And there was like three groups of young college students next to me hitting balls. So I was kind of listening to what they were saying. Mark, every single group 
every single one of them was talking about trading cryptocurrency. Every one of them. That's all they were talking about. And so it, it's just, I think if people realize that society's wealth is not a measurement of how many currency units are in the banking system, but the, the, but the amount of stuff that you can buy, the amount of goods and services it produces, then people would realize the, the path we're on. But it's, I just, um, I don't have any hope there for people realizing it, but let's take it back to an investment uh, theme here. Um, gold has gone down for the last six months or so, and I wish it would go down further because I'd like to buy more. And I like the gold miners here because it seems like everyone's just completely forgotten about the gold and gold miners and focused on other things where you can get a 10x return in a week. So wh All what's right. your view on gold and the gold miners right now uh, for the long term? <laughs> well, it, what you said is absolutely correct. Uh, for the last six months, since August uh, last year, in 2020, the, the gold, uh, gold is down 18%, and uh, gold miners in some cases are down 30-40%. I mean, they had a big correction, uh, and I think uh, at the present time, uh, we had for the last two months selling of the two major gold ETFs. So the assets of two major gold ETFs are contracting. That's actually a very good uh, news because it shows gold and silver and platinum are really not in a bubble. Yeah, right. You know, they're not in a bubble. Now, someone may say, well, they've had it because of this and that and so forth. But in general, I would say technically, also if I look at the stock prices today, I think they look actually good. And I think they will rally. Now, would I predict that gold will go to $5,000? No. But I think gold and silver and platinum are in a position to have quite a significant rally. Yeah. Do you, do you think that is predicated upon uh, real interest rates? Because there's a lot of talk that uh, it's all about real interest rates. So if real interest rates are increasing, then that's negative for gold. I actually talked to Bill Fleckenstein about that, and he said that that's not always true. That that was his view based on his experience. So what is your experience with the price of gold and real interest rates? Is there Are they directly correlated? Well, in the 70s, uh, real interest rates were always negative and gold went up. And in the 80s, real interest rates were high and gold went down. And uh, between 1999 and today, interest rates were, depends how you measure inflation, but in general, they were not uh, high in real terms. In other words, they tended to be negative and gold has done okay. Now, I think uh, a different view would be to say, well, if interest rates are high in real terms, then it's bad for a lot of assets, not only gold. Mm -hmm. It would be bad for real estate, it would be bad for consumption, it would be bad also for cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. I think the key for gold taking off, off, taking off is that the cryptocurrency craze comes to an end. I'm not giving a view here whether there is merit to some cryptocurrencies. I think eventually the whole world will have cryptocurrencies. But it also means that the supply of cryptocurrencies is going up a lot in future. Now, maybe the one or the other crypto like uh, Ethereum, Ethereum and uh, especially Bitcoins, they may become the most accepted ones and the ones that perform best. I think right. uh, bitcoins could go much higher. But as long as these cryptos go up strongly, uh, the big buyers of the big potential buyers of gold, silver, platinum will not be there. Mm. They have already positions. 
the outstanding position in gold is large, and they may add a little bit, or like you, they may say, well, I'll buy if it comes down in the final sell-off. I have recently increased my position in gold because I consider it to be an asset of relatively high safety. And I don't trust, A, the governments, and I don't trust the economic statistics they publish. All I can tell you, if you open your eyes, you can see how many businesses have closed. You can think how many will reopen. Yeah, well, on that note, I wanted to get your view on just what's going on with the the government lockdowns and the government getting just more and more involved in not only the economy, but in our everyday lives and how you see this playing out. And what's shocking to me, currently I'm just, I'm sick and tired of everything that's going on just on a personal level. And I'm trying to find a place where I can get some sort of reprieve. And uh, there's very few countries right now where you can just get away from, let's call it the insanity. I mean, Tanzania is one place that I've actually looked into going just to take a break from it all. Um, but they're very, it's, like, it's like they're, all these countries are all on the same page. And we hear now Chile is going back into lockdowns. Um, there's more draconian policies being implemented in Europe. I mean, and I try to think through what is the end game? At what point would the politicians come out and say, okay, it's done. We've conquered everything. No more masks. We can go back to normal life. What would, I mean, will we ever get there again? I guess is the question. Yes, this is, a, this is the question. I think maybe the governments don't want to reopen. Maybe they will reopen for politicians and their relatives and so forth but not for ordinary people. They will say, yeah, if you want to go to a pub or to a movie, you need a vaccine. And six months later, they will say, well, now you need another vaccine. And, you know, they can do things. What I'm more wondering about, since that's my suspicion what the governments will do, knowing how vicious they are, and how incompetent the worst people are always the bureaucrats they can't find a job in the private sector they failed at everything but in the government they get rewarded so you have the the collection of the worst people in governments and they tell you what to do and whereas your salary and everybody's salary is being cut their salaries are being increased. That's the way it is. But I, if I were 40 years old and I had my uh, physical presence the way I had it when I was 40, I would start the revolution, you understand? But when I look today at the world, why would I start the revolution? Tell me why. For the Vogue Society? for people who want more government interventions, for people who don't want, they they accept that you have to show an ID card when you go on an airplane, when you go anywhere. You enter a building in America, you have to show your ID card. But to vote, they don't want that. I tell you, the US has gone mad. The country, is deranged. Yeah. You're in Thailand right now, I I assume. And so how is it in other parts of the world? I mean, since this whole lockdown thing uh, was instituted, I've been in Colombia, I've been in the U.S. Virgin Islands, in Puerto Rico, and St. Bart's, and in a few states here in uh, the U.S. And it's it's a little bit different from place to place. How is it where you are? Well, the government uh, goes from day to day uh, with a different program. Mm. And uh, you have to see, in Thailand we have different provinces, we have different cities and so forth. 
And so it's never a uh, universal program. But right. Where I live in the north of Thailand in Chiang Mai, there is no lockdown per se. But say you can't, uh, the, the bars are closed after 12 at night and uh, there are very few tourists coming. Because overseas travelers, when they come to Thailand, they have to go into a quarantine okay. for 14 days. So who wants to go for 14 days into a hotel, being locked up in a room, <laughs> cannot smoke, cannot drink and so forth? Uh, some people can, but most people can't. As usual, there's corruption. So, uh, what I want to say is, we don't have a lockdown where you are told you can't leave your house. And in my case, it wouldn't matter because I have a large house, I have a large office nearby, and I have uh, plenty of land, so I can walk around, have dogs and so forth. Uh, but in England, I know cases where people had the house and the garden. They went out to the garden and were arrested uh, because the lockdown involved uh, not the right to even go out of your house, not even if it's your own property. Right. Never in history has any government been as uh, restricted of people's personal freedom as the government that we were told is a democracy and guarantees our freedom. That's the yeah. best joke I ever heard in my life. For 20 years during school time and university, I have to hear, oh, democracy is good because we are free and the communists are bad because they have no freedom. Never under communism could people not leave their homes and go for a smoke anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's go back. You said that you would start a revolution. I'm, I'm interested. How would you do that? <laughs> yes. Well, I would advertise, you know, in Europe uh, for everybody to disregard any restrictions to open their shops or go to the streets and walk around in masses. The police would never be able to hold out against millions of people walking through the cities. Never. In my opinion, most policemen, they have children, they have relatives, they all have a small business. Most of the policemen would agree with uh, the instructions they receive from above, from politicians that go to their homes, weekend homes, that go out to uh, the restaurants that are reserved for government officials. Of course, you have to broadcast it and you need a certain capital and you may run afoul the government. But I think uh, the more the government would intervene against somebody who would start such a revolution, the more that person would become a hero. Yeah. Well, well, we'll see. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if I told you this, but uh, my, myself and another gentleman named Robert Barnes are in the process of suing the Federal Reserve. I was Just because for for kind of the same type of reason, and what they did back in 2020, where they just blatantly ignored the Federal Reserve Act. And for me, I was just shocked that they would do that, and the mainstream media wouldn't say anything about it. They just they just turn a blind eye. They sweep it under the rug. And uh, just because it's something that needed to be done. But at that point, if the laws that are there to constrain the central planners are being totally ignored, what's to protect the citizen from the politician or the central planner or the central banker? There's absolutely nothing. So in the process of suing them under the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, just try to get some information and then just try to push this forward so we, at least we can send a message to the, to the society, to the average Joe and Jane, that, hey, you need to pay attention to this. So hopefully that will, will trigger something, who knows. But I'm just, usually I like to talk, especially when I have someone like yourself or Jim Rogers, you know, my favorite investors, I like to talk about investing, but with what's going on with personal freedom, it seems like that's really 
I mean, you just said that you've never seen anything in your life that's like this from governments Not around seen the world. Anyway, I haven't seen anything, but I've never read about it in the whole history of mankind that resembles what happened. Hmm. So, I mean, where do you think this is headed? I, I, that's, I'm sure, the question on everyone's mind. Well, I think we are heading... I wrote a year ago a report about uh, Hannah Arndt, who wrote about totalitarian regimes and how it happened in Germany, how it came about in Germany. Right. A very detailed study. And I would uh, suggest that it's likely that we are moving into a totalitarian state. The question is the ruler more of a militant dictator, right wing, or is he more of a socialist? For the average person on the street, it doesn't uh, mean much. Uh, the issue is usually when they're on that way road, when they're on that road, uh, when monetary policy and fiscal policies fail, and they have failed, they haven't lifted the standards of people that everybody can see and feel. But the government, of course, says, oh, it's because COVID. No, it's not because of COVID. It's because of the government's interventions. Once they know, and everybody can see that it's failed, they will go to war because printing money allows to go to war initially free of charge. And the, in every war, the first 30 days were popular because the media will say, well, it's the Chinese, it's the Russians, it's the Iranians. They'll blame someone. A politician is a person who is brought up from young to blame any problem on someone else. Have we ever seen a politician to take personal responsibility? <laughs> Never. At least in former times, the king or the emperor or the leader, they went into battle at the front of their armies. <laughs> yes. Right. Now, they sit... Even in America, there's a small demonstration. They almost shit in their pants and go into a bunker under the White House. That is, these are the heroes we have nowadays in the U.S. But the people in the U.S., with few exceptions, they are folks. Uh, they like that. They like weak leaders. They like idiots like you have in New York as a mayor and as a governor. They love it. Yeah. So you think that this leads eventually, who knows when, but you think this leads to a war between the United States and just fill in the blank, XYZ boogeyman that they create? Yes. I think so. Yeah. And, you know, maybe the first I thing watch too many war movies, but I tell you. If I look at all the wars that started, I see no reason at all how the differences of, of opinions could not be solved without the war. But they all went to war for completely irrational reasons, completely right. irrational, or for power or for fear to lose their power. There was always a motive of someone who thought he's going to get a huge advantage from going to war. Do you, do you think there's a possibility that the United States could go to war with itself? And, and you know, Possible. like some sort of, I, I hate I to use the word friends, war. They think that, I have some friends, they think this will happen. Yeah, I mean, I know you were here two years ago, but I can tell you now, Mark, that the divisiveness in the United States is far greater than it was when you had the people that were like pro-Trump, 
an anti I mean, I thought it was bad then, but now <laughs> it's at a whole new level. And now you can see whose side you're on just by, by going out and looking if they're wearing a mask or not. <laughs> yes. so have- I can believe you because I get all these emails from my readers. If I write something good about Trump, I'm a traitor. <laughs> yeah. If I write that the election uh, were very dubious or questionable, I'm almost lynched by some people. <laughs> yeah, but but now it's, it's it's very funny. Yeah, but now it's at a whole new level. It's not just politics, Mark. It's 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 wearing a mask. It's it's what it's you everything. It's yeah. everything. Yeah, everything so, is politicized. But as I said, luckily I live in the north of Thailand, and there are some disadvantages for me as a, at the present time. I can travel, but only amidst a lot of difficulties. And I say to myself, I'm quite happy to be here. I've learned a lot. I studied history, the the parts of history that I didn't study when I was young at school, including Chinese history, the history of uh, music, the history of India, and the history of the Middle East. And... I learned a lot about music and I have my garden and I have a quiet life. I don't have to put up with the unpleasant uh, American immigration officers that have zero education and that have to teach you about everything and take your nail clippers away. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm reasonably happy, but I can understand that someone who is 30 who likes to go to discotheques, as I used to like, and go out to pubs and drinking and be social, that for him, the current restrictions are hell. Mark, what have you learned most by studying history? The greatest lessons you've learned that you could, that you would want to communicate to others? Well, there were some wise leaders, uh, not too many. But uh, I think uh, one of the histories uh, that I believe in is that people actually may read history, but then they commit the same errors. And I can assure you of all the wars I read about, I I think none of them actually make sense. Mm. You know, Gallipoli was a complete disaster, complete disaster. And uh, the Crimean War was a complete disaster for no reason. Right. So, and World War I as well, World War II as well, you know. But I've learned one thing is that if you look at the world map in 1900, <laughs> 1900, okay? There isn't a single American military base anywhere in the world outside the U.S., okay? Nowadays, how many they are? There are 250 around the world. So who is the aggressor? Russia, China, Iran, or the U.S. imperialistic uh, neocons. That has to be told to the world very carefully. The U.S. always says, oh, well, but we uh, we go into a country to improve the government, to bring happiness, <laughs> to bring democracy. Go and ask someone in the Middle East, in Iraq, in uh, Afghanistan, in Syria, in Libya, how much happiness the U.S. brought them, <laughs> ask them. Yeah, so Mark, what would you do, and I'll, I know your time's running short here, what would you do if, if you currently lived in the United States and, and you had to stay in the United States, what would you do from an investment standpoint and what would you do with, with your, your personal situation? I mean, would you move to the country? 
to get a same type of setup that you have now? Would, would you get a second? I mean, what, what would you do as a plan B to make sure in that you were hey, is it the countryside is a good idea because in the countryside, you will always get food in a big city. Uh, the food supplies can be interrupted easily. The water supply can be interrupted easily. The electricity supply and so forth. So I think food security is uh, far better in a small village somewhere in the U.S. Uh, preferably not in a democratic state. Right. And number two, I would diversify my assets and have some assets outside the U.S., but where the custody is also outside the U.S., you understand? If you have an account at Merrill Lynch or Bank of America or at Morgan Stanley or at uh, J.P. Morgan and you hold some foreign securities, it's different than if you have an account in another jurisdiction. That I want to make perfectly clear. It's different if you hold a fund that invests in real estate globally than from you owning a building somewhere in Thailand or Vietnam or Japan or Europe. It's a big difference. Yeah. And so forth and so on. I'm not a tax consultant and, you know, I prefer not to give uh, too detailed information about how to do all these things because I don't want to be a suddenly handcuffed <laughs> at the CIA <laughs> sniffling <laughs> around the whole of Asia and trying to steer trouble wherever they can. Yeah, no, I think the concepts are fantastic. And that's what we're really looking for. So, uh, Mark, I really appreciate your time. I just I, I love talking to you for the viewers who want to find out more about what you do. Where can they go uh, to gloomboomdoom.com? All right. Fantastic. Gloom, boom, doom, all in one word. OK, we'll go ahead and put it up on the screen and put a link in the description. Okay. But we'll have Very it. Kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mark. Nice enjoy to you. Yeah, and have, a, have a nice day. You too. Hi, guys. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to join me in Miami this June 11th through the 13th for Rebel Capitalist Live, the investment conference. And this is not over Zoom. This is face to face. I'm bringing a lot of your favorites from the Rebel Capitalist show to Miami under one roof to speak to give you the knowledge you need to increase your personal freedom, to become a better investor and make larger returns over the next few years when we have this financial uncertainty that's being caused by the Fed and the government. And finally, it's gonna give you an opportunity to really take your understanding of macroeconomics and the world around us to the next level. We've got some incredible speakers lined up that are gonna completely blow you away. People like Mike Maloney, Jason Hartman, Ken McElroy, Lynette Zhang, Mark Moss, Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, just to name a few. The tickets for this event are really gonna sell out fast, so make sure you go to Rebel Capitalist Live right now to get all the details and to reserve your spot. We need to come together as a group, as a community, especially after what we dealt with in 2020 and 2021, so we can learn how to build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments. And we need to do this as a group, as a community of fellow rebel capitalists. So don't waste any time, head over to rebel CapitalistLive.com, and I will see you in Miami.